Hi, this is Jim Hall, and this is Satoshi Inoue-san. And we're here to talk to uh, guitar players who are interested in playing jazz. We're still interested in uh, learning about it. Um, we're doing uh, volume one of uh, a three-part instruction series. And this particular volume is uh, aimed at players who maybe have a background in, uh, in rock and roll, or blues, or folk music, or classical music, or um, even music from other cultures. Um, I think one of the great things about jazz is that it is a, a, a cross-cultural music. It's kind of a, of a universal language. Um, maybe we should give them an A to tune up to, just in case, at first. And I'll tune up with you, too, at the same That's about where, where the pitch is going to be. The, uh, the first thing that we played is called Big Blues, which is uh, something I wrote a while ago. It's dedicated to a great saxophone player named Stanley Turrentine. And some of the notes were supposed to sound like Stanley's playing, like this, this sort of thing, you know, which he does on a saxophone. Uh, we thought we'd start with the blues because that seems to be kind of a common, uh, a common ground between. Wh where did you first? Uh, you started in in rock I, and roll. I uh, yeah. I was influenced by sorry, British rock music. British rock music. Yeah. At the time, uh, they called quote unquote progressive rock. Progressive rock, <laughs> right? But uh, it's a, uh, it's a rock. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I'm used to blues scale right. uh, uh, at that time. Uh, Play like a kind of a rock and roll rock blues roll. scale. Oh. Or just uh, the, the kind of, it's like a five tone oh. scale, basically. Yeah, that's what it is. There's pentatonic scales in, in Japanese music, too, I think, right? Uh, I think so. You think so? <laughs> <laughs> you should find yeah. out. Um, that blues, the particular blues, has a kind of a simple motive to it, which is just... And then it's the same idea. Up might be fun to see how, uh, e even if I just pared that down to um, the first motive and, and we played, played the same motive over those three basic chords, uh, the three basic chords being the F7, right? F7. And then the B flat. B F7, B flat 7, back to F, and then B flat for a while. He's playing a major third. He's playing, yeah. Satoshi's playing an A natural, and I'm playing that, it's called a blues note there. And then the C7. And then a B flat 7. So that's, that's practically a pentatonic scale. Plus uh, this. Uh, oh, you're right, yeah. yeah. What do you call this? Yeah, I guess you'd call that a blues note. Or it, you can get that by bending the string. Yeah. Yeah, we won't talk a whole lot about um, um, technical stuff too much, like how to hold the head, because Satoshi plays the guitar quite differently from the way I do. Technically, he holds it differently, and his hand is... You tend to play a little bit more above the strings, I think, than I do. My hand tends to get down in this position a bit. Uh, George Benson plays that way. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I think I pull down on the strings a little more than you do, maybe. Um, anyway, let's, let's try that same progression. And instead of me, what I did with the motive was I did this, this thing. Then I just opened it up. And then as an answer, 
because I, I feel that the blues is really a kind of a story with, with two questions and an answer. Then the answer. That sort of thing. So let's let's just do it with the first part of that. That part. And uh, I'll play the same motive and you'll see how it sounds different over those three chords. Two. One, two, three, four. part of that. That's the second phrase I'm playing on. take those little motives, those little ideas, and, uh, and present them in different settings, I think. And in a certain sense, that's what jazz is. Uh, and that's, that's the way I approach it, is developing short ideas. What, what was the first jazz music that you heard? I guess that was, uh, I think, Wes Montgomery. Yeah. Uh, friends uh, introduced to me a record called Boss Guitar. Boss Guitar of Wes Montgomery, yeah, and, that's uh, great. Also, my guitar teacher then uh, told me, get the Jim Hall's, get Jim Hall's, uh, <laughs> Jim Hall's uh, first record and uh, Alone Together, because two records is very good. The Alone uh, Together was uh, Ron Carter. with Ron Carter. Yeah. Right. And the first one, the jazz guitar? Yeah. Oh, you have that? Yes, I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was my very first record. The, the first album I did is called Jim Hall Jazz Guitar with uh, Red Mitchell on bass and Carl Perkins on piano. That's nice. Um, the first uh, jazz guitar that I heard was Charlie Christian on a record with Benny Goodman. Uh, it was a Benny Goodman sextet, and it was Charlie Christian. And, uh, I never got to see him play. He, uh, he died really young. But that was, that was a big influence on my life. Um, it, so it seems that, first of all, I, for me, learning about jazz is a, is a lifetime process. I mean, I still, I'm sure you do the same thing. I still work on it every day. I listen to music all the time. Um, I listen to all kinds of music. But I think that the process, it, in order to learn it, like if, if I were to learn Japanese, which would be incredibly difficult for me, I would probably have to live in Japan for a while and really practice and hear it all the time. Uh, and that's what it was like for me learning jazz. Even though I lived in America, um, I had to listen a lot. And, uh, and I'm sure you have, too. So. Yes. Uh, being in New York is... Uh, it's a help. Lots, lots, lots of a chance to yeah. listen to uh, great players. Yeah. Jazz, jazz dialect, which you call it. <laughs> right, the jazz, the, yeah. Jazz language, language, yeah. language of jazz. Yeah. Yeah, it, it does take a lot. Just it, And also, if I were to learn um, uh, rock and roll, I guess I would have to, <laughs> have to, have to yeah, right. change my hair <laughs> and uh, listen to a lot of rock and roll for a while. So for me, uh, as I said a little earlier, this has been a kind of a lifelong process, and, and I still work it, uh, work at it every day. And uh, uh, it's, it's great for me in so many ways because I travel a lot, and I find people all over the world, in Japan, in Europe, in South America, who play, who play jazz music. And, it's sort of, and I can play music with people that I can't even talk Speak to. Speak yeah, language. Yeah. Right, so the language isn't any problem. Uh, 
also it keeps changing your playing keeps changing with you don't you f find that I think so yeah, yeah. Is it I'm Somehow, I hope so. Too. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure your experience of being in New York has changed your playing a lot. Right? I think so. Yeah, it's, it's so it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a record of your of your personal growth. I think you know, as well as a musical thing, it's a personal thing. It's like uh, it's similar to if if you have a child and you want to see how the child grows and you draw a line at the top of the kid's <laughs> head on the on, on the wall, wall, right, and then in two years he's up, and then he's further up. Um, so it, it's a combination of fun and uh, seriousness and lots of listening, I think. It, so it's, it's work, but it's the kind of work that, uh, that's, re that's really enjoyable, and it, and it goes on forever. Let's talk about the sounds of the guitar a little bit. I, oh, I, know, I know you you have two pickups on your guitar. I, I never really noticed that before. Uh, well, mainly I use this uh, front pickup. Uh, you have no choice. Right, I have no <laughs> choice. I just have this one. Yeah, I kind of go for a, basically a mellow sound. I think, but uh, that back pickup. Yeah, some is, some. Oh right. Oh, I see. You know. Uh, Oh, I see, right. Mellow? Yeah. And then what about, uh, depending on where you play the guitar with your right hand, the picking, I mean. Oh, I mean, picking? You show, yeah, show how that changes the sound, too. Oh. Depending on wh how close to the bridge you play. Oh, I see. Oh. Uh. If I play some, oh, that's nice. Play some lines that way, okay, then, with uh, different sounds. Right, yeah. Right. And then, um, also, depending on what string you play something on, right, it sounds, sounds quite different. Very brave to try that. That's all right. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Maybe. That's good with the open B. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this this A flat and this one and this one and this one all, each has a, a different sound from the other. And, and I think that's good to explore. In fact, um, a lot of times I practice just on one, one, string. one string, maybe. I think that's uh, that's really good practice for a number of reasons. Um, one is that what we talked about earlier, that each one of those has a different sound. Each string has a different sound. And depending on what feeling or, or um, what texture what, that you want to get out of the guitar, you can pick and, pick and choose from different strings. Also, I think more important is that it helps you by practicing on one string or two strings or whatever, it helps you to really start to hear the instrument, which, which is so important um, because jazz music, all improvised music depends on hearing something and then playing it instantly. So the, the more control you have over what sound comes out, the better. If you're having to guess about what sound you're going to get, then you're in trouble right away. So this this is a bit playing on one string is a bit like playing the trombone, you know, where you, you have a uh, a wind oh, position. Yeah, Different you have position. a wind column, an air column, and and you just change the uh, the uh, 
length of it. And two and, and the, an, an interesting thing happens if, if you play on just on one string for a while, you feel limited. But then if you just add one more string, it's like freedom. You know, you really <laughs> Lots of freedom. You're right, you have a lot yeah. of freedom to go. When I was working with Jimmy Jufri, um, who's a great clarinet player and saxophone player, Jimmy had a lot of things written where I had to uh, to blend with the clarinet. So uh, if if Jimmy had something like say uh, for the guitar and the clarinet, if I were to play it like picking all those notes. Uh, to Jimmy, that sounds like tonguing on a trumpet or something. Mm -hmm. Right, so he would say to me, find a different way to finger that. So I'd have to come up, or almost ending, to, to leave out the right hand strokes. So I, I worked on that quite a bit over the years, and I, I, uh, I do a lot of uh, slurring with the left hand. And and this the right hand is kind of playing like uh, what's called sweep picking nowadays, I guess you know. Uh, let's see what. Oh. Right, just in one direction, pretty much. I just the idea with the right hand is just to set the string in motion, and the rest of it's done with the left hand. So that's just two strokes, really. Just a down stroke instead of the, which is a different way to do it. Um, a lot of the uh, the guys playing today have incredible right. You have a really nice right hand technique. Um, my most of my technique is in the left hand, I think. That's almost nothing with this hand. It's all with the left hand. That's all. That was all just one stroke. I just let the hand fall. Pat Metheny and or John Scofield, mm -hmm. uh, they use that kind of. Technique. Yeah, yeah. They both use that. Uh, they both have very good right hand technique too. Pat Metheny has a fantastic technique, uh, and. One thing I love about John Schofield's playing is the variety he gets in his sound. But I think sometimes he pinches, pinches the strings, and sometimes he plays down here, and sometimes up here. Oh, variety in the sound. Variety yeah. of sound, right. Uh, but a lot of what I do is, is based on left hand technique. And the right hand is, for me, is basically to set the string in motion, just to get it started, mm -hmm. and, and for accents, as opposed to, to picking alternate oh, picking, which, which is also important as a tool. Um, but again, it's, it's similar, it's just like tonguing on a wind instrument. So I, I think it, the main thing is to be aware of what you're doing and what kind of sound comes out with it, I think. I think you, dynamics. Um, dynamics. You're talking about loud and soft and thick and thin and all. Yeah, that yeah. yeah. I, I really think uh, they're imp very important attention keeping devices for one thing, uh, because uh, for instance, all all uh, everything on a high string would get boring. I think that's the. <laughs> That's the secret, is that things get boring if they don't change. So um, maybe dynamics within a phrase. You know, loud and soft, and also different uh, 
dynamics in terms of uh, thick and thin, like this would I would consider thin. And this a little thicker. So I work with all those elements. Again, the same way that a painter might, with different colors, uh, different shades. Um, and occasionally, if I'm playing a tune that has a middle part, like a bridge, um, like on Body and Soul, or one of the, one of the other standards, I might I might play the uh, the middle part of it different from the uh, from the way I played the other, just for contrast. Yeah, maybe I'll play the bridge with chords, and play the beginning with single line, or or vice versa. So I, I consider those elements to be dynamics in a different sense, besides loud and soft. And and I think it's the same with all the music of all cultures, really. It's contra at contrast, I guess, to keep the attention. They're all attention keeping devices, getting and keeping somebody's attention. The same as it's when I'm talking or when you're talking. <laughs> For a long time, I resisted using any uh, foot pedals uh, because I thought of them as kind of gimmicks. And, and then little by little, I, Bob Brookmeyer wrote a piece for me one time for a symph it was symphony orchestra and electric guitar. So Bob had me using um, uh, a chorus foot pedal a uh, distortion foot pedal and a wah wah pedal, I think, maybe four. Oh. But so I was dancing all over like Fred Astaire, and uh, it it occurred to me as I was doing that that um, a lot of the big bands, like Duke Ellington's band, for instance, used also. They I think that's where the wah wah term was invented with the mute that the oh. trumpets did. You know, like wah 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 wah. That's what oh, it I is. see. So. <laughs> So my excuse for using foot pedals, if I need one, is that it has to do with orchestration for me. And I, I try to use them um, in the way that an orchestrator would, and, and I try not to overuse them. Be because I, I think if you play with the foot pedal on all the time, then you've, you've spoiled the whole effect. Then it, then it sounds common. Um, another thing that happens I think a positive thing with foot pedals is that it sort of throws your mind into a different uh, frame of mind. Di different frame of mind, right? And you start thinking differently. Uh, I use the uh, the chorus pedal a little bit on that. Uh, right, this this one. I used that earlier on when we were playing that thing in G minor. It gives it a little bit of a distance effect. That. That's with it on, and this is with it off. So it, that presents a slightly different color there, the same as in a painting. But if I left it on for the whole evening, then it, then you wouldn't even you wouldn't even notice it. And then when I did the Miro piece, I used this other foot pedal, which is tuned is set for uh, thirds, the, the whammy foot pedal. So I would just use that for, for certain effects, or if I want a real dissonant effect. Yeah. For <laughs> Quite a while, I was trying to do things like Don Pullen does on the piano, where he, he plays that way on the piano, and I was getting him almost hurting myself. And it got dangerous, so <laughs> Larry Goldings, my piano player, said I should get a foot pedal, which does it for me. It's just much easier, so it's a, it's a little bit of a lazy way out. But also, it has kind of a mysterious effect, I think. And I could never play thirds that fast without it. Unless you had a 12-string guitar. Too. Uh -huh. So that's my, uh, my reason, my excuse for using <laughs> foot pedals.
the other thing that I that I really work on in my own playing is taking a, a little motive, like three or four notes, and developing it. Uh, so if we were to, let's see, if I were to play on this blues again, maybe, and just use, use that note. That sort of thing a lot. Take a short idea and develop it in, in order to get uh, in order to get more control over the which makes your solo memorable. I think, to yeah, the audience, yeah. Right? And uh, by by working on uh, w with material that you that you've invented yourself like that on the on spur of the moment, it makes each solo a little different and, as you said, memorable. And uh, if I were to play, on, say, a standard ballad, like that thing that we that we talked about earlier, which is it's based, it's similar to the chords to "I Should Care." Maybe in E flat, we could play a, a ballad that way. I, I would play that quite differently, but I'll do the same thing with developing the motive if I can. About one, two, three, four. <laughs> Thank you. 
tried to stay with a little idea that we, um, you were playing such nice chords that I, I think I got off of the motive. But um, that was quite different from, from what we played on the, on the blues, I think. I think one of the uh, really important things in jazz music, any music, and, and probably in all of life, really is to have some, um, some direction, some kind of rhythm and in the, in the arrival points. And I think that's what chord progressions are all about. Like two, two, five, one has a direction. And a right, right, like an upbeat and a downbeat. Uh, same as the as the pulse in the in the body yeah, has right. it. Yeah, right. Like an in and out and up and down. I, th I think that's all related, and uh, the same that applies to uh, playing a line in music. So maybe maybe we could uh, just play on that chord progression for a while, like two five one in. Uh, in G major, so you'll you'll have A minor seventh, right to D seventh, you know those chords, and to G, and we'll do that for about for a while, like about one, two, three, four. We should we should uh, we should publish that. Oh. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> is is transcribing is important to the uh, guitar student. Um, th I th I guess because it is because jazz is a is a language or a dialect of a musical language that. You probably have to do everything possible to uh, to uh, to learn it, and and I I learned maybe just one or two solos when I was a kid. I, I learned one of Charlie Christian's that I liked a lot, uh, which was uh, on a blues, and uh, I learned I think one solo of Barney Kessel's. So you didn't do much. Not not so much, um, but what I did. And, and I want to ask you about the same thing. What I did was I would try to get the, the general feeling of what somebody was doing. Um, instead of uh, transcribing one note by note. Yeah, instead of specific mm -hmm. notes. I, I, for me, it was the feeling that was more important. Some people transcribe. Uh, Mike Stern still transcribes solos all the oh. time. Uh, I, you do some of that too, I think, right? Uh, yes. What, what did did you transcribe, or did you learn some other solos, of, uh, recorded solos of people when you were starting? Uh, yes, I, I transcribed your solo. Oh my <laughs> okay, you owe me a dinner. I don't have an answer about transcribing, but mm -hmm. somebody told me uh, uh, transcribing, but you don't have to write on a 
paper, or somebody told me you have to write on the paper. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the on the person. person you yeah. know. What, what do you think about uh, this? I'm maybe too lazy mm -hmm. to write things down, but I, but I like the, the one of Charlie Christian that I remember. It was so clear. Mm -hmm. It was a blues in F again, uh, same key that we played in earlier. But it was it's on a record called Grand Slam, the, the Benny Goodman Sextet, and Charlie plays. <laughs> And that was such a great first phrase for me. That really got my attention. Uh, it's still, w when I hear that record today, I still wonder what he's going to play next. So, so the first phrase is, see. And then the second one. starts like and that was for me that was such a marvelous solo uh, partly because of its clarity that first phrase Great. That's like the first line of a short story. And I imagine that it sounds like he played with all downstrokes. In the, I don't know. Uh, I never saw him play, as I said. Uh, but I mentioned that it reminds me of, of writing, like uh, short story writing, in a way, because it's so clear. And uh, what I was going to say earlier about the idea of transcribing is that I think, for me, it's important to listen to solos, listen to players who play other instruments, too. Oh. And uh, so I listen to Lester Young a lot. I listen to Charlie Parker. I listen to uh, Coleman Hawkins. Uh, I listen to lots of piano players. I listen to Bill Evans a lot. Um, it, again, not to get specific notes, but just to get the, the general, general idea. Feel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it depends on the individual whether or not you actually want to transcribe things. And, and writing them down, uh, I think that would be good for your, your general music. Uh, uh, to gain your sight reading. Right. Because sight yeah. reading and notation is really important. The more, the more tools you have, the better, I think. Sometimes, uh, once you write it down on a paper, sometimes you forget. You forget <laughs> it anyway. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Oh, I write it down, and uh, job was done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then, right. Then you forget. But, That's interesting. Yeah. It's like then it's over. Yeah. Sometimes, I think uh, memorize, use uh, memorize, uh, memorize the solo is mm -hmm. maybe important. Mm -hmm. I, I find that I, for me that mm. would be more important than than writing it down, uh, except. Uh, except as a record of a recording of it. Another thing that I'm interested in, and, uh, um, and, I, and I use a lot, is I, I like to get the idea of, the, of what the song is about that I'm, mm -hmm. that I'm improvising on. And if it's a, if it's a ballad, I, I like to know what, the, if I don't know the exact words, I like to know what the words are about anyway. I think Lester Young was very interested in in words. And so is Sonny Rollins. Mm. When I worked with Sonny, he would, uh, he would hear something maybe that Frank Sinatra had sung. Uh, he'd hear it on the radio and so that we'd start playing that tune. But, oh. but with, that, with that version of it in mind, with Sinatra's version. So I find that that's uh, really important. So maybe we can sum this thing up a bit and then yeah. end with... Uh, how about the, uh, uh, you think uh, listening only, listening to only the guitarist would not be uh, appropriate for those who, uh, who the guitar guitarist who wants to have own, own style. Oh, their own, yeah, right. 
Wolf on Wolf. Again, yeah. right. It's just, this is just my personal feeling on it. But for me, the, uh, the beautiful thing about jazz music is that it allows you to find your own voice, your own way of saying things. Classical music, I imagine, is more limited uh, in that the, the notes are, are pretty much set, although the ways of interpreting them vary a lot. But, but the great thing about jazz for me is that it, it can really be yours. It can, it can be Satoshi in the way, and it doesn't have to be me or Charlie Christian. Um, so it's very helpful to me to listen to uh, players who play different instruments so that I don't imitate so much. Because if I listen to too many guitars, um, and then I'll start to sound like the other guys. And, uh, and that's when I heard Wes Montgomery the first time, I knew I would never be able to do that anyway, but he did. So it, that helped me to find my own, my own style. And also, I, I would much rather uh, look at paintings sometimes than, than even listen to any kind of music. So, so I, I look at paintings and maybe do some reading, read some poetry. Mm -hmm. I, I think all those things help. To, to find yourself. Oh, I see. And then... Uh, other than music. Other than music, you right. See, uh, you read the books. Yeah. Go to the museum. Yeah, I don't read very much, but <laughs> I read, I'm careful about what I read. I don't read the news, I read poetry, though. So, and, I, and I do go to museums, and uh, uh, I like painting very much. I like food very much, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, I guess the main point is that uh, I, I draw uh, inspiration from all different kinds of things, uh, bes besides music, uh, poetry and painting and uh, and food, food and things <laughs> and scenery, nature, I guess. Uh, in order to to uh, to express those things on the guitar, and uh, the the technique of playing the guitar, like just the physical part of it, I. I think that, I mean, I would suggest that you, you had a teacher when you first started, right? Uh, not really. I, I st you started by yourself? I was watching a TV. Uh, there was a program for... A uh, learning program? Yeah, learning oh, yeah? program. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. But then anyway. you had a teacher later. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, because I, I, I had a teacher at, at the very start when I first started. I had two or three teachers in a row. So I guess you can learn just the, the physical part of it from a teacher. Also, there's lots and lots of really good books about scales and arpeggios and picky technique. So what we've been talking about is, is a little more general and a little more just associated with music uh, itself, uh, as opposed to the, the technique of the guitar. For me, the, the things that I practice have to do with uh, with specific things that I'm working on uh, personally. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's a song that I'm playing at work that I'm having trouble with, so I'll practice that and that sort of thing. But I, but I do practice, uh, I shouldn't say constantly, but almost constantly. And if I don't practice for a couple of days, my hand starts to feel terrible. Um, and we're going to finish this first volume of the uh, of the teaching videos with um, a piece that's dedicated to my friend the cartoonist Gary Larson and it's called Whistle Stop. <laughs> 